A cyber attack of Australia's largest port operator has caused chaos in the lead up to Christmas, particularly over the weekend. DP World manages about 40% of the country's container shipments. But this morning, there might be some good news. It says things might look like they're starting to return to normal. Joining me now is the Shadow Home Affairs and Cyber Security Minister, James Patterson. James, good to see you. Uh, first of all, do you have any update? Kenny Heatley, our reporter, uh, is saying that things might look like they are starting to move on the port. Good morning, Laura. Yes, I was briefed by the company last night and they were hopeful that they would be able to restore normal operations in the next couple of days. And in the meantime, what they're trying to do is build a parallel system that effectively allows the port to continue to operate, at least for those high priority shipments in the meantime, so that it doesn't have too adverse flow on consequences for our economy. My understanding from the company is that they detected suspicious and unauthorised activity on their own networks at about 10am on Friday. And they took a precautionary measure to shut down their networks or effectively disconnect them from the internet so that whatever was happening couldn't proceed any further. Um, I also understand they haven't received a ransom note. It's possible that the reason they haven't received a ransom request is because they did dis successfully disrupt the attack mm. or it's possible that the attacker was not motivated by economic gain and, and maybe motivated by something else. James, it does sound like DP World was um, well equipped to deal with something like this. It was attuned to the threats its company uh, faced and even so, it's caused such chaos. That's a concern, isn't it? I think the company has taken the right decisions based on the information available to me to shut down their networks because if it was an adversary who was intending on causing us harm and not just seeking economic gain, they could have engaged in sabotage, which mm. could have been quite damaging in the real world, caused real world harm, and so it is precautionary and appropriate to shut it down. What I'm concerned about is that it doesn't appear that the company already had in place any backup system or redundant system where the port could continue to operate perhaps on reduced yeah. load in a manual way. And actually the power does exist for the federal government to require them to do that. Under the critical infrastructure reforms passed by the previous government, the Minister for Home Affairs can require a critical infrastructure provider like a port to yeah. have a number of redundancies or resilience in place to make sure that we can continue to operate in times of crisis and when there's a cyber attack. It appears that that hasn't been the case or the Minister hasn't ordered this and I've got some questions about why that hasn't happened. Ports are so obviously consequential for the operation of our economy and society and had this lasted any longer than it appears it's going to mm. or had it affected more than one provider, it could have devastating consequences for our economy. OK, let's talk about uh, a different story now and what we saw at the weekend uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. There is no doubt that anti-Semitism is on the rise. I'm deeply, deeply disturbed by the scenes we saw in Caulfield on Friday night, Laura. Um, people are entitled to protest for whatever cause they like, but to choose Caulfield to choose a park across from a synagogue and to choose Shabbat where Jews go to pray uh, at their shul or synagogue or where they gather in their homes for a Shabbat dinner with their families seems to me like a very deliberate choice. It seems to me like a choice that was designed to intimidate, that it was at times to, in, designed to incite and it had exactly the predictable effects that we thought it would. Hmm. And the Jewish community is in even more fear than they already were for their safety. We saw that shocking uh, rally through Sydney, uh, deliberately going through suburbs where there are a number of Jewish Australians who live, uh, terminating in Coogee. We've seen, uh, we've seen graffiti on Jewish-owned businesses. We've seen graffiti on, a, on the home of a Jewish uh, rabbi. And we've also seen an alleged assault of two uh, young men in the Jewish community on Saturday night. I've spoken to one of those victims and he's briefed me on what happened to them. It was a shocking uh, act of intimidation and violence, which what I believe the police them, are now James? investigating. Well, they were returning home on Saturday night from a night out with their friends driving through Caulfield and they noticed uh, two suspicious vehicles. So they did a U-turn to drive past and see what those vehicles were doing. Um, they couldn't determine what they're doing, so they continued on with their journey. And unbeknownst to them, those vehicles followed them into a side street in Caulfield, where, in, in Residential Street, where they'd parked to drop off their friends. Mm. Uh, one car pulled up behind them, one car pulled up beside them, and uh, a number of men got out of the car and surrounded the car and physically assaulted two of the passengers of the car uh, in the process of demanding access to their phones to demonstrate whether or not they'd been filmed or photographed. Um, the men who surrounded the car apparently said that they had been there for the protests, even though the protests had occurred 24 hours before. Um, and the young men are understandably very shaken up by this incident and have reported to police. And it's critically important that the police follow through on these 
uh, this incident and, and ensure that these people are prosecuted if they have breached the law, which it sounds like they might have. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you're right. These intimidatory tactics of not just rallies being held by pro-Palestinians, but um, some more intimidatory uh, figures going to Jewish areas of Australia, and that has a chilling effect uh, on so many families. I just want to end by asking you about Penny Wong's uh, comments. She didn't call for a ceasefire. She called for Israel to make steps towards one. What is wrong with that? I think it's a very, very generous interpretation, Laura. Is that the ceasefire we're having when we're not really having a ceasefire? She well, used those that's words. That's what she that's said, a very though. Deliberate choice of words. Yeah, she yeah, used those words. Yeah, and it's a very words, deliberate though. choice of words. Um, but the Australian government has never previously called for a ceasefire or steps towards a ceasefire. Our American allies, the Biden administration, are not doing so. And there's very good reason for that. Of course, there should be a ceasefire after Hamas is defeated and after the hostages are released. But until then, any ceasefire will just allow Hamas to continue to control Gaza. And they have said themselves they intend to use Gaza as a landing base for further operations against Israel. The people of Israel and the people of Gaza will never be safe while Hamas remains in charge, and a ceasefire will facilitate that. And I'm disappointed and concerned that Penny Wong has announced what appears to be a shift in government policy on insiders. I understand she did not give a heads up to the Israeli ambassador or embassy. I understand she did not give a heads up to the Jewish community. She has previously been very critical of the previous government for announcing foreign policy initiatives, including on insiders. Mm. And it appears to me that she's done the same. If the government is trying to walk back her comments this morning and say she wasn't calling for a ceasefire, I think that's a good thing. But I think she herself needs to be very clear about that because it is a significant shift if that's what the government is doing. I don't think anyone's walking it back so far. Have you seen, have you seen that? Well, I just interpreted from your comments, Laura, uh, oh, no. passing her comments, saying she wasn't calling for a ceasefire. It was only steps towards a ceasefire. I, oh, mean, no. I think that's a, yeah, a but she, distinction. I'm just, I, I just words are so important in this debate. You know that, James. So I'm just saying exactly what she said. She didn't um, call for an immediate ceasefire. She said steps towards one. And I think that nuance is really mm. important, is it not? I agree with you. And that point about words yeah. being important, uh, important is really critical because, unfortunately... We, are, we do see here in Australia tempers being whipped up and people getting very uh, ac activated over what is being mm. said. And so for the foreign minister on insiders to accuse, accuse Israel of, of attacking hospitals and for other ministers in the government to leave open the possibility that Israel is guilty of genocide or crimes, or crimes against humanity or war crimes is a very dangerous and inflammatory thing to do when we should be urging calm. I am deeply afraid, Laura, that something terrible is going to happen in this country. All the signs are there. And when you have synagogues being shut down on Shabbat because police fear for the safety of the occupants because there's a protest outside, mm. I think we need to call that out and we need to call it out for what it is, which is anti-Semitism. Yeah, well, I, I was pretty James, disappointed I'm, it took the Prime yeah, Minister. Look, I, I'm less concerned, took... to be frank, about um, Penning Wong's calls for steps towards a ceasefire. What I'm uh, concerned about is really not much from Anthony Albanese overnight in terms of condemnation, what we saw... Uh, in Caulfield, or kind of veiled references on um, Remembrance Day, um, and also yeah. um, from from Richard Marle saying essentially, look, um, we don't want um, any um, criticism. Essentially, we don't want any of these feelings being whipped up on either side of the bait. We don't want to see uh, Islamophobia. We don't want to see mm -hmm. uh, any mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. But what you are seeing is these intimidatory tactics in Jewish areas, I don't think you see Jews going into, um, you know, predominantly Muslim suburbs in Australia with flags. Correct me if I'm wrong. Agreed, Laura. Yeah. I agree with you. The Prime Minister has failed to show leadership here. Uh, it took him 24 hours before he said anything about the uh, protests in Caulfield. And when he did, it was a very generic statement about how we should all be very nice to each other and we should all get along. Yeah. What we saw was a specific instance of anti-Semitism. Uh, if there is ever a day where there is a protest outside a mosque that caught, leads to those Friday night prayers being cancelled and people being evacuated, I'll be among the first to call out Islamophobia. And when there are instances of Islamophobia, we should call it out. Yeah. But on Friday night, we didn't see Islamophobia. We saw anti-Semitism and it needs to be called out because it is on the rise. And mm. the stats from my home state of Victoria, at least, are very clear. The police have arrested nine people for instances of anti-Semitism and one person for the instance of Islamophobia. I think it's very clear the problem we have on this hands in this country right now. Okay. It is anti-Semitism. And if we don't deal with it, something terrible is going to happen. James, thanks so much for your time as always. Thanks, Laura.